Hi, Pastor Greg here. I'm the lead pastor here at uh, Buffalo Free Church, if you're tuning in for the very first time. And I just want to give you a heartfelt welcome and thank you for watching and spending your time with us in the next few minutes. I have a couple family announcements for the church, and if you're watching, you're part of the family, so let me give those for you. Number one, we are starting a new online app called Engage. And Engage is a directory, it does a whole bunch of things for you, and we want you to get set up on your phone with it so that you can be part of it. It allow you to give, it allow you to see your groups, it allow you to have phone numbers, the whole bit. So please contact the church office if you are interested in being part of Engage. Secondly, we have a No Regrets Men's Conference on February 6th. Now we're partnering with Buffalo Covenant Church, so it will be at their site. It'll go from 9 to 12. The event is free. Lunch is provided. So contact Buffalo Covenant Church to sign up. Also, we are having our own men's retreat, and that will be on March 5th through the 7th at Camp Chaminade. We will join men from other EV Free Churches and just have a marvelous time. The cost there is $109 for the weekend. That's all your food, your lodging, everything. So register online with Camp Shamanaw. Also coming up on the 31st is our annual congregational meeting. We will be doing it at 1015 between the two services. We are going to be looking at some new members. We're going to be looking at uh, some new elders and also a few changes to our constitution. There's just some little things we've got to clean up there. So we will need you here to vote on that. So all members are encouraged to attend. Also, we want to thank you for how you continue to give. We thank you for your gracious, gracious giving. Not only did we finish in the black over Christmas, but we thank you how you continue to give. Let me share with you what your giving does. Besides the lights and, and those type of things, we had a young man stop at our church Monday. He was a man, 21, looking for a home. And you might recall, it, it's, it's cold out there. And so I was able to sit down with him, and because of your giving, I had the time to sit down with him. We had the opportunity with our partners who we give to for this very purpose. We worked, with, worked it out. We got him lodging that night. We got him lodging this week. We've got him set up to have a place to live, all because of your faithful giving. So I just want to say thank you. From me to you, thank you for making those type of things possible. Also, we are in the midst of three, two, one. Three, we want to ask you to pray for three people. Pick three people you know. People maybe who are part of your family, your congregation, whatever. Pray for them. Two, we want to ask that you would contact two people, either via email or instant messenger or text message, and just make a contact with them. Hey, I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? But contact them. And lastly, one, we ask that you make one contact either personally or through the phone. You know, give them a call or, or talk with them. Personal contact, even more so than the electronic. We've had some great things happen. I've talked to people who came to me and said, Pastor, I've been praying for people this week. Pastor, I contacted so-and-so, and they're going through a hard time. I didn't know it, so I was able to pray with them on the phone. I contacted a friend and said, hey, what's going on in your life? And they said, hey, I got this going on. I'm having issues here, here, and here. And, and I'm able to connect with them, talk with them, and help them through it. So I want to encourage you to three people to pray for, two people to either email, text, or instant message, and one person to connect this week. Thanks. Good morning, church. I'm Tom O'Neill. This is my wife, Monica. We are here to talk to you about Divorce Care and the support group that we lead. Uh, we are going to be starting up the group on February 7th. Uh, we meet from 3 to 5 p.m. right here at the church. We'll also be meeting online through Zoom. So both 
opportunities are available. So if you or someone you know um, has experienced or is experiencing separation or divorce, please consider joining us. We would love to have you and help you walk uh, the path on this journey to healing. Um, and we also ask that um, everyone please share with uh, people around you who also may be needing this group and would potentially like to join us. Uh, we, we would love to help and support as many of those as we can. Um, you can sign up online if you're interested or someone you know is interested. You can sign up online at divorcecare.org. And again, it's the Buffalo Evangelical Free Church Group. And we will be starting again on Sunday, February 7th. Uh, we are also in need of some volunteers because we do provide child care for um, people who are attending that have children. So if anybody is interested in volunteering and helping out, even if it's once a month or once every other week, um, to support some of the um, children that would be coming with their parent, uh, we would love to have your help as well. So just give Tom or I a call if you're interested and we'd love to have you. I found out that he was having an affair. It was right after Christmas. It totally floored me. I mean, I was devastated. Was I not pretty enough? Did I not make enough money? Um, was I not successful in his eyes? I went and had a makeover to try to win my husband back. When I got the uh, divorce decree in the mail, it was just like another wave of grief that came over me. The depression got to be almost more than I could deal with. I was thinking it was me, you know, what am I doing wrong? I didn't think that you could hurt that much and not be dying. Going through separation or divorce is painful and traumatic. Unfortunately, few people understand what you're going through and even fewer know how to help. That's why there's divorce care. Divorce Care is a comforting 13-week group led by caring people who understand what you're going through. Each week, you'll watch and discuss a video that offers hope and practical tips that you can use to stabilize and move forward. It was just a relief. It helps you understand what you're going through. You know, why you couldn't eat, why you had no energy. I was given time in every class to, to talk about the pain. I could be me and no one would judge me. The divorce care became a, a lifeline. Well, hey, church family. My name is Braxton. I'm the Youth and Family Director, and I have the honor of leading us in the pastoral prayer this morning. And we're going to be in Psalm 127. So if you would turn there, I'm going to read some verses, and then I'm going to have you pray. There's going to be some, some silence for you to pray. Um, and I'll give you something to pray about, and then I'll close us in prayer together. So here we go, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, the worker of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects, protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously waiting for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. I want you to take a moment right now and pray that you would live a life that's centered on God, that's centered on the gospel. And if you feel like you're really killing it in that area, I want you to spend some time praying for someone who's maybe having a hard time with that, or maybe someone who doesn't know Jesus, and just lift them up in prayer. So I want you to take a moment and do that with me. Now let's keep reading. Verse 3, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. I want you to spend some time thanking God for the gift of families, both your family, but also the family of God, the church of believers who are together in this journey. And 
there are some families in our church who are grieving right now. And so during this time, maybe even lifting up the Clem family or the Rodelius family or a family that you know that's walking through some grief right now, that's really struggling right now. And uh, But I want you to spend some time just thanking God for family this morning. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for the gift of your word, the times that we have to f- reflect on your goodness. And I pray that we would live lives that are centered on the gospel, centered on the good news of Jesus, that we would find rest in you, that we would do everything in our lives to glorify you, to bring honor to your name. And God, we thank you for the gift of families. God, we lift up families in our church. I lift up the Clems, the Rodeliuses, families that are struggling and grieving right now with the loss of loved ones. I pray that you would equip families to walk with their children and point them to Jesus. God, would you help us as a church to come alongside families each and every day, encouraging them through your word, through relationships. And God, we ask now as we worship you through singing, through hearing the Word of God taught through being together, uh, that we would draw close to you, that our love and our affection would grow more and more, and that we would treasure just the truth of your Word, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and that you would change us by your Holy Spirit and through your Word this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. O hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, God. You do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. 
Praise the 
I used to work at a place called the Dinky Diner, just a tiny little hamburger and milkshake place, and it was a great place in this tiny little town. And I would have people come in from the high school, because I worked at during my high school years, and they would come in and they would order all their food and I would make it for them. And because we had a malt shop type feel, uh, we would make all sorts of unique drinks for people. And I had one friend who came in and he says, Greg, I want a little bit of everything. And so I took the, his cup and I would, would make, put a little Coke in there, a little 7-Up, a little Mountain Dew, a little orange, a little root beer, shot of vanilla, shot of cherry, and he would drink it. Well, one day he said, you know, I want everything. I want everything. All the flavors you use for the milkshakes, I want added to my drink. 
So I did it. I, you know, put in the stuff that I just shared with you, and then I, I, I put in a shot of chocolate, a shot of strawberry, a shot of caramel, a shot of pineapple. Uh, it, I mean, this guy had everything, and it was a cacophony of flavor. I mean, it was just crazy. So he takes it, you know, being a high school kid, he takes it, takes a big, huge drink, and I, it, the, his face was priceless. I mean, as the flavors just clashed on his tongue and the sugar overload hit him, uh, to his credit, he drank the whole glass, but uh, he never ordered it again. You know, when we mix drinks like that, you know, mix our sodas, uh, the worst we can get is maybe a bad taste or a sugar rush. But there's a problem when we mix our faith. When we mix our faith with our culture, when we mix our faith with other religions, the results can be disastrous. And you're going to see that in today's message. We are in Judges chapter 10, starting in verse 6. The people of Israel did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They mixed their faith. And the Asherah, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Sidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. As they mixed their faith, they forgot their faith. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of the Philistines. In other words, he took his hands off and said, You want them, Philistines? They're, they're yours. And into the hands of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was severely distressed. I want you to see some lessons. Number one, when we reject God, we automatically replace him. You never stay neutral. They reject God and they take seven houses of gods and put in his place. You know, you might say, uh, I'm going to reject God, but, but I'm not going to put anything in his place. Problem is, you can't do that. You always replace him. Here we see they replace him with seven. That is the, the picture of perfection, the picture of completion. That means they've completely rejected God. They put somebody else on the throne. They're at their lowest point. So God gives them over to the very people whose gods they now worship. And for 18 years, they cry out to the gods of the people who oppress them to save them. Talk about craziness. Yeah, yeah, they're gods I'm going to worship, and it's their people and their gods who oppress me. But we'll still worship them. You know, we do that too. I, I'm overworked, but I'm going to work some more. I, I want to seek pleasure, and instead of investing in my marriage, I'm going, to, I'm going to look out here and find something that's going to destroy my marriage. We're no different. Secondly, I want you to see this. Idolatry brings enslavement, and enslavement brings more idolatry. Whenever you move to a new idol or a new little G God, your life becomes entrapped in it. And the way we often try to find freedom is to chase that God even more. That's what the Israelites did. We thrash around and we become more meshed in this net that's over us and, and it brings us in and we keep looking back to that which made us sick. Now, perhaps you're thinking, Pastor, that's great, but I don't have an idol. I can ignore God, but I won't replace him. I want to make sure you understand what I mean by idol. So let me give you a great definition. I got this from Pastor J.D. Greer. It is a wonderful definition, and it goes like this. An idol is whatever you go to for power, joy, and significance apart from God. So what do you go to for power? 
What do you go to to say, this is going to make me happy, it's going to bring me joy? And what do you go to to make you feel significant? If it's not God, it's your idol. So friends, you want to be known? No, no, you want to be a success. Those aren't bad things, unless that's where you go first. Is it your beauty, your intelligence, your skill set? Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a relationship. Whatever gives you power, joy, or significance apart from God is your idol. And it's going to tease you. It's going to tell you things like, you're never going to be happy without me. It's going to take over your thoughts. It's going to take over your life. You're going to feel like you can never have enough of it. And, it, and if you get it, you're now scared that it's going to disappear. You may find yourself making horrible choices just so you can possess it. I need security, so I'm going to work long hours, neglect my family, neglect my God. I, I will misuse my authority in people's lives so I can know what it's like to be in control. The problem with an idol is it is never satisfied. It always claws at your heart for more. Let's go back to the scriptures. We're in chapter 10 and verse 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Good start. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and the Ammonites and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Mananites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods you've chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. I want to share with you the scariest truth about God. God will give you what your heart truly desires. If your heart truly desires God, then he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. But when you want other things, when I want other things, he will put us into their power, into their hands. Secondly, I want you to see that God desires true repentance. Look at verse 10. God, please help us. We don't like being hurt. We don't like this, this problem we're going through. And God says, no, 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 no. You're playing a game. You're playing the game. Let's make a deal tell you what God will will repent if if you'll deliver us we'll repent if if you'll give us what we want let's make a deal God they're mixing their pagan faith which is what they would do with those other gods they would make deals they would make sacrifice they do things to please them so they would help them and God says I, I don't operate that way he says, calling out to me with your repentance is not like the right words to a spell or an incantation that I have to respond to. I don't play that game. He says, if you want to play that way, then there's your false gods. Go get them. But notice that God thirdly responds to true repentance. They stop playing games. They stopped trying to make deals. First time was just to be saved from their problems. They wanted a deal. But now they say, we want you. We want you. Notice what they said. We'll do, do what you want, God. We just want you. And then they back it up. There's no crossed fingers. There's no foot out the door. There's no secret agenda. God, we want you. And if you will repent and turn to God, God will respond. They have a pure heart. A heart that called for repentance. 
and it was followed up by actions of getting rid of their idols and obeying God. Their hearts have been changed. A repentant heart is a changed heart. It says, God, I agree with you and what you say. I have no excuses. I have no requests. I have no conditions. I just want you. Which leads us to the next point. God always knows the difference when you're trying to use him and when you're trying to worship him. A lot of times we come to God and we go to worship, we go to church just to use God. Hey God, by doing this, you gotta be on my side. And God says, no, I want a heart that seeks me. But notice he's personal. God is personal. He loves his people. I love that, fa that, that, that phrase. He becomes impatient with their misery. This is a fancy way of saying God is saying, I am going to respond to your needs. And so he does, chapter 11. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. One of the things about Scripture, Scripture does not hide the thorns, the warts, the scars. It lays it out like it is. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Jephthah's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out, and they said to him, You will not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And Jephthah, the, oh man, I cannot pronounce his name today, fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around him and went out with him. So let's see a few things that we learn about him. This is the guy God is going to use. First of all, he has a rough start. He comes from an unacceptable mother. He has a family issue. And in, in that culture, he was going to be written off. Friend, I don't care how you begin. I don't care your background. I want you to get this. God does not care where you've come from. He cares where you're going. And I want you to see this. Jephthah has a mom who's a prostitute. They run him off. He's rejected. Do you know Jesus had a prostitute in his family tree? Her name was Rahab. She would become a woman who God the Father will place in the very lineage of his son. Though Jesus, the broken and unwanted, are redeemed. Through Jesus, they're not only redeemed, they're used by God for his purposes. Now, you may be thinking, Pastor, you don't know where I come from. Jesus doesn't care about your tough start. He, he will not allow it to stop him from loving you and healing you. Notice he's rejected. His brothers run him off. Jesus was rejected by men. Notice that Jephthah goes to a faraway land. He gathers outcasts around him. He becomes a small-time warlord. He has an area of land he controls. He's a great warrior. For all intents and purposes, the story should have ended there. He's an outcast. He's gone. He's got a little kingdom of his own, but that's it. But God intervenes. This morning, I, I, I want to talk to you who think your story's over. You think everything's set. It's not. But, Pastor, life's passed me by. God is here to intervene in your life today. You may have experienced challenges. You may have experienced hardships. Please know that God is not through with you. Others may have walked away, but God never walks away. Look to him and see where he's working in your life. See what he wants to do in you. God is ready to intervene. Verse 4. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And the Ammonites made war against Israel. The elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And I'm just going to call him Jeff from now on. And they said to Jeff, come and be our leader so that we may fight against the Ammonites. And Jeff said to the elders of Gilead, Hey, didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come now to me when you're in distress? In other words, you don't want me. You just want to use me. And the elders said, That's why we've turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head, be the leader over all the inhabitants of Gilead. 
So they're like, whoa, 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 we made a mistake. We should never ran you off. So come back. And he's going, no, are you going to use me and throw me away like you did with God? No, 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 no. No, we're not going to do that. Just like with God, we realized our mistake. We need you. So he acts. He sends out a message to their king. And Jephthah sends messengers to the king of the Ammonites. He says, what do you have against me? Why do you come against to fight my land? And the king responds. He says, because you stole my land. You're on my property. And you did it a long time ago. And Jeff responds. Number one. It's never been your land. It belonged to another people, not you. Number two, we took the land because they attacked us and God gave it to us. And three, if you really believe that your God is going to give this to you, come and get it. King says, fine, I'm coming. Then we come to a very key verse. Look at verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jeff. And I just want you to get this. This is enough. God's Spirit is upon him. In the days of the Old Testament, what would happen is God's Spirit would come and go. It would come and be on a person and then leave. That's why David, when he's crying out in his confession, says, please do not take your Spirit from me, because the Spirit would come and go. For you and I, who are Christ followers, we are given the Spirit of God at our conversion. He resides with us. He lives in us. He's not just upon us, but he's in us. And friends, I want you to get this. That is enough. That's all we need. Because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, this, the Spirit makes us accepted, loved, forgiven. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more because Jesus took care of it all. And he made us the children of God. And he, what he did is enough. Our Jeff is a product of his culture. And it's a culture that took a smorgasbord approach. Have you ever been to a smorgasbord? Those are kind of fun. You walk in, they've got all sorts of different kinds of foods. And you pick the food you want. You get a little this, a little that, a little this. And when you come up to the plate and set it down, and, and you sit at the table, and you get ready to eat, you may have some unique combinations on your plate. And again, that's fine for a smorgasbord, but it's not fine for our faith. Smorgasbord, you may get an upset stomach, but with your faith, it becomes tragic. And that's what he did. He took a little bit of what he understood about God, a little bit from the false religions, a little bit from his culture, and he tries to mix them together, and he has disastrous results. It ends up in a tragic mess. So verse 30, And Jeff made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, in other words, Spirit God's enough, but no, no, I don't, I don't need just the Spirit. I want to do it the Spirit plus. If you'll give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of my door of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jeff crossed over to the Ammonites to fight them, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He's trying to play let's make a deal with God. Why? Because it, with all the other gods that he had worshipped in his day, that's how you played the game. If you want something from that god, you give him a big gift. The bigger the gift, the more you got. But God's spirit is upon him, and God delivers the enemy into his hands despite his attempt to make a deal. Why? Because the spirit of God was upon him. Now, there's a lots of, of Christians who try to play this game. God you do this for me, then I will do this for you. But God doesn't play that game. He provided everything with the gift of Jesus Christ. He makes you his child. He showed you that you are loved. He pursued you when you didn't pursue him. He gives you eternal security. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him more favorable to you because Jesus did it all. 
There's only one deal God ever makes with you. He gives you everything when you give him your absolute surrender. When you give him you, he gives you his righteousness, he gives you his family, he gives you everything. He doesn't play let's make a deal. Now let's look at the tragic error. Then Jephthah came home to Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. Well, notice how he deflects here, friends. It's not her fault. We'll get to that in a moment. For I opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do according to me what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, the Ammonites. And she said to her father, Let this be done for me. Leave me alone for two months, that I may go up and down the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. And then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, and she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileite, four days in the year. He sacrificed his own child. There's a few things I want you to get here. Number one, God never commanded or asked him to do that. This was his doing of let's make a deal. Secondly, God told him already no. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 10, the, the scriptures are clear. Do not do this. This reveals a lack of biblical truth in his life. Now he tries to say Hey, I made a vow to God, and now I have to keep it. I want you to hear me. God never expects you to keep a vow that goes against his clear, expressed will. Did you catch that? Jeff Def had a way out. He could have said, God, in these last two months, as my daughter's been God, gone, I, I, I've been thinking about this. And I was wrong. I, I'm, I'm disobeying your scripture which says never to do this. And in my foolishness, I didn't realize that you were enough, that it was your spirit upon me that was enough. I didn't need to make this vow. This vow is, is part of, of my pagan heritage. So I repent and ask you to forgive me. I, I will, I will sac sacrifice a a, a lamb, I'll, I'll do something else, but Father, I know you would not be pleased with the sacrifice of a child. I confess my sin. It reveals that he's a product of his culture. Violence was rampant, life was cheap. This is not how you please God. It's how you please the false gods. It shows that he has a mixed faith. But are we so different? We sacrifice our families for our own happiness. We sacrifice what is important to pursue wealth, fame, success. We sacrifice our walk with God to fulfill our own desires. We approach God to find out what he can do for us instead of with a heart of worship, a heart of awe, a heart that says, you are my God and I kneel before you. Are we really that different? Now there's some Bible scholars out there who say, no, I think what he did, he didn't mean for his daughter to, to be sacrificed. Um, you know, the way the houses were built those days, animals had a, had a bottom area that they could come in and out of, kind of like a, a built-in barn. And so he was thinking that maybe a sheep or a goat would have walked out and he would have sacrificed that. Well, maybe. Maybe. But... Uh, he said it would meet me. So it sounds like he's talking about a, a person. So some think that he was hoping it would be a servant who walked out. Think about the horror. Someone he has authority over and he's going to sacrifice them because he's bought into his culture. 
Others have suggested what he did was he sent her to work at the tabernacle for the rest of her life, never to be married, never to know the joy of being a mom, that that, that would be what he did. But the passage seems to suggest, no, he did the unthinkable. Now, some of you may be going, well, what about Abraham? Didn't God make Abraham do that? No, 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 no. Don't ever allow skeptics to take you down that path. Abraham was a test of faith. He was a test of obedience. God saying, this is what I want you to do. With God always going to put a, a new sacrifice in Isaac's place. God was always going to spare him. God was always going to choose another. And here's what else happened. He did it. Jeff did it as a way to pay God off. He wanted to make a deal. And that's a very different set of circumstances. Abraham was obeying God on a specific action. He was trying to make a deal. So why did he keep his vow? Because he mixed his faith and thought he needed to make a deal. He did not understand grace. Friends, if you make deals with God, that shares with us that you do not understand grace. And you may not understand the gospel. Because the great news of gospel is it's not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy that he saves you. You cannot make a promise, you cannot make a sacrifice to earn God's favor because Jesus already did it for you. But here's where some Christians get into trouble. Well, pastor, I, I've been really good, so God owes me. That's playing let's make a deal. Pastor, I give money to God, he has to bless me. That's playing let's make a deal. Pastor, if I, if I serve God, he has to do this for me. And when hard times hit, these are the folks that walk away because they're going, God let me down. I did all this. God owes me. No, that's let's make a deal. And you don't understand grace. And if this is your thought, this is how you process, then you're mixing your culture and you're mixing other faiths into yours. You want to please God? Put your faith in what he has done for you in the person of Jesus Christ. But the story gets worse. Chapter 12. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed Zaphon and said to Jeff, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? Reminds us with Gideon, right? We will burn your house over you with fire. We're going to kill you is what it's saying. And he says, Hey, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. In other words, you didn't even bother to come, and now you're throwing a temper tantrum. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand, crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up with me this day to fight with me? Now you notice he's not trying to negotiate. Then Jeff gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. Now, here's the problem. They should have worked this out. These are fellow Jews, fellow countrymen. But the Ephraimites come in and they say, hey, we want the glory. We, we, we want to bully you. We want you to say what Gideon said. Boy, you did great and we did nothing. He's not in, in the mood, so he, he brings a sword instead of a negotiation. And he defeats them. But here's the thing. He doesn't just defeat them. He kills them. He sets a trap. They go down to the Jordan River. They've already been beaten. The men of Ephraim are running away. And so he goes down and, and blocks the Jordan River, the only way they could go back home. And he says, now, if they say Shibboleth, if they don't say it right, that means they're Ephraim. In other words, I can't tell the difference of who we are by looking at you, but I can tell by your, your dialect. And so if they say Sibboleth instead of Shibboleth, guess what? You're going to die. And so all the ones who couldn't pronounce H were put to death. 42,000 fellowed Jewish people were put 
to death besides his daughter. Now, his story ends this way. Verse 7, Jephthah judged Israel for six years. Then he died and was buried in his city of Gilead. I want you to notice, they were oppressed for 18, delivered for six. This is the first time this deliverance has, has, has flipped. Up to this time, they would be delivered for a long time for the time of oppression. Now, there's four questions that come out of this story. Four things I want to leave you with. Four things I want you to think about. Number one, does the gospel and the scripture interpret my culture or does my culture interpret my gospel and the scripture? Am I a product of the gospel and biblical truth or am I a product of my culture? Which one influences me the most? Now, you can either adopt your culture, or you can totally reject your culture, or you can critically examine your culture in light of God's word. And that third way is the way I'd encourage you to live. Take what the culture says and say, what measures up to scripture? Next, do I live a life based upon God's grace, or am I trying to make deals with God? Are you saying, thank you, or, hey, let's make a deal? Do I understand, thirdly, the impact of my idolatry upon others? We saw with Jeff that it cost him his daughter. We saw that it cost him 42,000 men. What's the impact of your idolatry? And lastly, who is my Savior, my King, my Judge? Who is it? Is it me? Is it something in the world, or is it the true king? As we conclude, I want you to see the picture of Jesus. When Jeff tried diplomacy and it didn't work, he fought and killed his own people. When pleading did not work with us, Jesus took the fight to sin and death. And when someone had to die, it wasn't us, it was him. We don't offer our child's life to please God, but God offers his only son to save us. I like what Jen Wilkins wrote. Jesus did not take us to the river Jordan and threaten to kill us if we couldn't say the word shibboleth. But he took us to the cross to pronounce shalom, that is peace and salvation over us. Jetheth believed that he could find God's favor by offering a sacrifice to God. Jesus found us favor by being the sacrifice. He gave us God's riches at Christ's expense. This story reminds us we need a better savior, a better judge, a better king. We don't need one that's broken like Jephthah. Fortunately, we have a savior who offers the grace of God to us as a free gift. You see, my friends, faith in God's grace is the key to our Christianity. Faith in the finished work of the gospel. So God's acceptance of you is not found as a reward for your perfect works on your behalf or some deal you try to make with God. Our righteousness comes from God to all who simply admit they need Jesus Christ and take his worth for what it is, a gift of grace. Will you take his gift of grace today? Whether you're a Christian or someone seeking, we all need to live in his gift of grace.